The one thing I also like to, if you are cross training or you're a triathlete and you're still doing marathon, I mean, the miles that you do on the bike, the, the, the hours that you cross train that transfers over. So in your overall mm -hmm. general buildup for your race, you want to look at that. And you also want to look at, um, ways to recover and, and the best ways to recover are just go, go spin on a bike or go for an easy swim. Mm -hmm. I mean, getting that blood flow is super helpful. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hi, everyone. We are back with part three of our Back to Basics series, and we are talking about the run. We talk about how to build up run miles safely, how to get faster on the run, all about cadence, nutrition tips, and more. Also, we are now one week into our 250 Miles in May bike challenge to support this podcast. And yes, you can still join and enter all the miles you have ridden so far. You get stickers, a custom water bottle, and a chance to show some love to this podcast. We don't run ads. We don't have a donate button, so this fundraiser is a great way to keep the episodes coming. From guest interviews to race recaps, training tips, and just general thoughts on life and sport. Check the show notes for the link or check our Instagram bios at Amy Woods Fitness at, at Angela Nath. But now, back to the run. Have a listen. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. We are finally doing part three of our back to basics run Q and a to wrap up our swim bike run back to basics. And this is the third week in a row. We've been talking about running, which is fantastic. Um, but, uh, we are excited to just talk about the run and get you all ready for race season and building your training. You ready, Angela? I am ready. So we got a ton of questions from our, I race like a girl, uh, closed Facebook group, and we got some on Instagram. So we're just going to go through it and see how it goes. So our first questions are based around getting back into running and building up mileage. So let's, question number one is, uh, this person is just getting back into running. Should I focus on long, slow runs or build up speed? And that is a really awesome question. Sounds like a test. It sounds, I know. Your, your teacher's I know. coming out. <laughs> I know. So um, what are you going to say to that? I, I mean, we'll I think similar. it's pretty general knowledge that you just want to start slow and progress little bits at a time. So I wouldn't do long, long runs. I would do more, uh, quantity over, uh, that doesn't even make no, sense. frequency, frequency, more frequency, yeah. which is quantity. Yeah, no, you're right. More frequency in days versus say two or three longer days. I would even go like four or five days and do 20, 30 minutes and kind of progress from there, depending on where you're, where you have started. Mm -hmm. And then, and I would not even worry about speed at all. Oh, Don't cool. even look at speed. Just keep it so easy. I've talked a lot on here about coming back from injury, even though you didn't say you were injured, but you can kind of almost think about it like that. You mm -hmm. want to come back real slow. I would definitely start with a walk run mm -hmm. and you can pick the interval that is right for you. You can do a two minute walk, one minute run, two minute run, one minute walk, and then just slowly progress. And for the, in the beginning, um, you know, running every other day or, or like four times a week, but shorter mm -hmm. will be okay. And if you just keep it so easy, recovery, heart rate, maybe aerobic, don't even worry about pace. And that's how you want to start. And once you get that base, then you can throw a little bit of strides in, maybe some 20 second strides. You can do some, a little bit of hill strides. And then once you start to get the turnover in your legs and maybe you're up to longer run intervals, then you can start working on maybe some power with hills. Yeah. Some hill, hills yeah. and strength and then progress from there. One thing I like, if you are starting from the beginning, I, I, I do this with a lot of my athletes. I love this progression. But if you're starting zero from scratch mm -hmm. or if coming back from an injury, I like starting four minute walk, one minute jog, repeat that four or five times. Two days later, do a three minute jog and a two, I mean, sorry, a three minute walk, a two minute jog, repeat that five times. In then, the workout, five yeah. times in the workout. Yeah. And then 
two days later, if all if all is good, do a four to one. So, or sorry, a, ten, a two three. So you're walking two minutes, jogging three minutes, and then the next one would be uh, walking one minute, jogging four minutes. And then once you get past that, then you can kind of start the 20 to 30 minute continuous jogs. And it's done every second day until you can get to 35 to 40 minutes continuous. And then I I tend to just let my athletes progress from there because they've really built a solid base on their feet. um, And we're seeing no signs of re-injury or any type of issues. So yeah, I think the biggest mistake I see is that people just try to come back too fast Mm -hmm. from taking a break and there's no need to rush it. We used to, you told me once when I was coming back, you said, hurry slowly, meaning what you were just talking about, do the progression, but do it slowly and cautiously. And then if anything doesn't feel right, you just back off to the interval that did feel okay, that run walk interval. Um, And before you know it, you'll be running continuously. But again, like we talked about in the past couple of podcasts, there is nothing wrong with walk breaks at all in training or in racing, whether, you know, that's like a 30 second walk break or one minute. So don't be afraid. Don't worry if you can't run for straight 45 minutes. That's okay. Um, And so based on that, there's a, we have a follow-up question, which I think follows up nicely. So let's say you're running and you want to increase your mileage, mm-hmm. maybe for a race or just for personal goals, but you don't want to get injured. And that, I mean, and that's a really good question mm-hmm. because more time on your feet and more run miles, you risk injury. Mm-hmm. So how do you build up run mileage without getting injured? Yeah. I mean, it depends where your background is, but if you're just kind of, let's just start if this person doesn't have a lot of run mileage. Again, adding the walk run components are fantastic. When Even when I am in full on training and I do my longer runs and I know you, you do this as well mm-hmm. is I put in walk breaks all the time. If I feel a little funky or things aren't feeling right, I just stop and walk for, mm-hmm. you know, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, that's one way. I also get some athletes to hike. So just go out for a two, three hour hike, like time on feet is mm-hmm. massive and that will be beneficial. Um, and then what I also do sometimes as I progress, the longer run is split it into two. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't put a lot of stress on the system and you're a little bit more recovered versus, so let's say if you're going to do an hour and a half run and you're just getting up there, sometimes two 45 minute runs in the day are, um, is a lot better because you're fresh for a good amount of that versus like, as you get into the hour to hour and a half, like you slowly get more and more tired and you're not really striking properly. Mm -hmm. So it's just a good way to add mileage that way. And how long, if you do two runs in a day, how many hours do you suggest between your runs? I like three or four hours. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. And I like, I mean, there is that 10% rule. Don't increase your mileage more than 10% a week. Mm -hmm. And you know, it just depends on the athlete. It depends on what else you are doing. But I, I like, you know, giving up a, a steady progression. Like if you're doing a six miler as your long run one week, do a seven or eight the next Saturday or Sunday, then do an eight or nine and then back off for a week and give yourself a little less miles. And then you can build back up just slow and steady. So if your long run is six miles this weekend, you know, don't go out next weekend and do 10. If you have never done a seven or eight or nine, you just want to make sure that you're progressing same thing with coming back from running, just progressing slowly. And you can do that by miles or you can do that by time. So if you were running an hour this weekend, maybe you run an hour 10 next weekend or something like that. Um, And be patient because Mm -hmm. it takes time to build the muscular endurance. Oftentimes our fitness is there, but the, but the time on the feet, like you said, is Mm -hmm. not. So your chassis, your chassis. Thank you. So you have to just be patient Uh, and know that you'll get there and then don't compare yourself to anybody else. (laughs) So that also is something um, to make sure that you're not looking at somebody else's run time or run mileage and feeling like you need to be there because everybody is different. Mm -hmm. All right. So that was a good one. Moving on. And this is, I mean, these are all three really big questions we're starting with. (laughs) And maybe we should have started with this, but I'm glad we started about return to running. Mm. How do you get faster on the run? 
That's a massive one. That's a massive question. And it's kind of like we talked about how do you get faster in the swim? How do you get faster in the bike? So there are so many components to getting faster on the run. And we actually have some other questions that Mm -hmm. I think will dovetail into this, or we can just lump them all together. All right. So let's just break down some ways you can get faster on the run. What is when I said that question, because Angela has not seen these questions. (laughs) So (laughs) when I said that question, literally, what was the first thing you thought about? Patience and consistency okay. equals success. Love it. So when I say that, you know, that was actually told to me when I was in high school by a Olympian. Uh, I got to go to this special conference as a track athlete and she was there. Oh, and wow. Her biggest thing was patience and consistency. And so if you can have um, patience in terms of building up your run and really getting a really solid aerobic base, going at an aerobic pace versus just trying to hit that threshold, feel good pace that you think you're going to get faster, I would really stick to, you know, that low aerobic zone heart rate training is massive, massive, Mm -hmm. massive. And then speed really comes from, you know, after that is built, slowly adding stride, slowly adding a little bit of speed work. You don't need to do speed every day. Mm -hmm. It's like once a week for the first six weeks after you feel like you've built a pretty solid aerobic engine. And sometimes that takes eight to 12 weeks. I have athletes that I have not done speed, speed work for four months because I just don't feel they're ready to get there yet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, you, you keep seeing improvements in the aerobic pacing. So I don't want to hinder that with a bunch of speed work that makes them tired. So until that plateaus, I don't even add speed until I see that they need it. Yeah. And also you have to look at their race calendar. Yes. You know, if their race isn't for five months away, you certainly don't need to be adding any speed work, you know, four to six weeks before a race. If, um, if they're ready for it, Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. So I really like what you said about patience, because even if we're just talking about patience within a season, but patience over years and years Mm -hmm. and years, Mm -hmm. it just takes, it takes a long time to build speed as a runner because you know, it's funny. We often talk about swimming where we talk about form and how you can just swim and swim and swim. But if you're not working on all those little things in the swim, it's so complicated with the catch and the pull and all of that, that you're not going to get any faster. And we joke that like, oh, if you just keep running and keep at it, you'll get faster. But there's a lot that there's a lot of little things that go into running faster Mm -hmm. um, and speed that we can kind of get into now. We have a question that dovetails into this, and that is, why is cadence important in running? And so I think cadence is another way to get faster. Mm-hmm. Um, common, I mean, the common theme, no, no, I want to say the, um, standard, the standard is that a lot of people talk about and write about is that 180 steps per minute is a cadence that is going to get you where you want to go. That's a really solid cadence. Uh, to know that you're a pretty efficient runner, one way to show efficiency. Mm -hmm. But that can vary depending on how tall you are, Mm -hmm. how long your legs are. So sometimes to give a little wiggle room, like down to like 175 Mm -hmm. uh, can be pretty good. And you can get even higher than that. Yeah. Like what's what's yours? Amy's 5'1", right? Yeah. Uh, a, a low, I mean, a high five one. A five one <laughs> on a good day. And, but I have also really short legs and a long yeah. torso. My cadence is probably about 185. Okay. And when I'm racing, it can be 190 and as high as 200. Yeah, that's, that's it's amazing. wild. Yeah. And I just, I don't think about it. I don't think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 185 is pretty average for me, 188. These little legs got to move twice as, <laughs> twice as fast as other people's, but it does, and it does make me a faster runner, mm-hmm. um, along with some other things. So the first thing you want to do if you're looking at speed, getting faster on the run is you want to find your cadence and you mm-hmm. can do that a variety of ways. If you have a stride pod, which we will talk about because uh, somebody asked a question about that, that automatically will uh, count your cadence for you. you your can, watches do it too now. Yeah, your watch, your um, you can count it yourself. And so find your cadence. And I would say a lot of people that some people that I've been coaching, a lot of people are around like 165, which is yeah, 165 to 170. So we've been working on cadence, which we'll talk about in a second. And you want to slowly up that cadence, use Mm -hmm. either your metronome on your watch, or get an app that is a metronome and put Mm -hmm. an AirPod in your ear 
And but don't go crazy. Don't automatically put it up to 180 because you're going to be like, whoa, like go five beats higher, go to 170 and try that for like 10 minutes, five yeah. minutes. That's one way to do it. And uh, see if you can work on your cadence. That's one way to work on it. How else would yeah. you do it? Um, I personally love the metronome on my on my watch. So mm-hmm. I I have it make a noise beep and also vibrate. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm 5'5", five five and my cadence is around 182-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I go to faster speeds, it gets to about 186. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of my athletes, when we started looking at this, again, were quite low. And I, I had them just do use the metronome because – even if you're getting off the metronome, it'll continually be there for you to kind of reconnect with Mm -hmm. mentally. And so I wouldn't be too concerned um, if you come come on and off it because it is going to take some time to change. The biggest thing about the better cadence is it's better run form. Mm -hmm. You want your foot to stay underneath your body. So basically your shin, um, well, your tibia, should be at a 90 degree angle as you land either forefoot or heel it that's up for debate but mm-hmm. that doesn't quite matter it's just that you don't want to overstride every time you overstride you're basically breaking yourself from going forward and that's obviously the opposite of what we want yeah. um the injury component is so much more increased when you have an overstride like that um, you're just putting so much impact on the body that's like it's not quite underneath you. And you want to have that forward lean. And the only way you can have that is if your feet are directly under you and you're able to get that nice, beautiful ex- extension of your leg and that lean that propels you forward. Right. Um, so I, about four or five weeks ago, I went to a run center in Boston to get my gait analyzed when I was having some of that low back stuff going on just to make sure my run was okay. And they videotaped me in sneakers and barefoot. And I was on this like fun treadmill and I had to read words, the colors of the words. So I would distract myself and it was like the word gray, but it was in yellow and I had to say yellow. So they made me do that. So I wasn't thinking about my stride. And then we analyzed it and I found a few things. One, my cadence was really high, but I did find they said that my tibia, my shin was like Mm. directly Mm -hmm. under me. So I had a really beautiful, like where my foot strike was. I mean, I don't think you could have the cadence you have otherwise. (laughs) Yeah, no, I am not even close to an overstrider. No. Um, And what was interesting though, is they said I didn't really have a forward lean, like I was Mm. upright, but... I think it was the treadmill because Mm -hmm. since then I've done some analysis and had people look at me and I I do forward lean. Uh, The one thing I did figure out is I, I strike the ground pretty hard. Mm. (laughs) So they were surprised by that. Uh, That's, that's one thing I like about mm -hmm. the, the, the stride is Mm -hmm. it it will tell you your, your impact rate in milliseconds. Yeah. And you can just constantly look at that. And it has a lot of different algorithms to come up with form power ratio, which is part of that. Like you really want to be able to, as you land on the ground, it's a quick and then forward movement. So it looks at all these different things. So that's something to really analyze if you wanted to look a little bit deeper mm-hmm. on, like you don't have to go to a clinic like you did because right not everyone has access yeah to that. I did it because then you get to meet with a PT mm-hmm. and she really helped me out but my run form was pretty good which I suspected but I was trying to just you know cross every cross, T yeah. and dot yeah. every I and all of that jazz uh so you don't have to go to a run center but you can film yourself and have somebody your coach look at it or somebody who knows about run form, look at it. You can show it if you go to a physical therapist who knows about running. And actually, just Mm -hmm. a quick plug for us. Yes. (laughs) Angela needs coaching, which Amy and I coach under that. Um, We can do run analysis. So if you check out um, that on the website, angelanae.com. Right. We can can help you out. Yeah, we can. You can email (laughs) us and we can do that. And oftentimes... A lot of what I see is a little, is overstriding, mm-hmm. but it's the same thing with swimming. Like if you don't see yourself doing it, hundred percent, you're agree, like yeah. you think you're doing it okay. I think I like when when we had our camp, we did a bunch of videos for yeah. people, and people are like, "I look like that," yeah, and they just have no idea because you think you're swimming well, or mm-hmm. you think your arm is 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 going wide mm-hmm. because we told you to 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 put it out more. 
and it's actually perfect, you know, like, so it really just helps to have a visual. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking about? You know, those mm. memes where it was like, what I think I look like when I run versus oh, yeah. what I look like. I was like, <laughs> that's like me. <laughs> um, but so working on cadence and then there's a lot of run cadence drills you can do to help you feel that quick feet, quick feet. Mm-hmm. And they're all over the internet. I actually have been working with two of my athletes and I made a little a 15 minute run cadence drill workout that they do before their runs right now. Mm. And, you know, it's the, it's some of the basic stuff like a skips and B skips and things like that. But you, we talked, I think a long time ago, you were jump roping a little yeah, I was, bit. I was just going to bring that up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Skip rope, uh, rope skipping, skip roping, skip roping. <laughs> skip I like roping. skip roping. Skip roping. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> actually is really, really helpful because it teaches you to be really light on your feet. Yeah. Um, and you can get better and better at it. And so like, you don't have to do a lot, just, you know, five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's with some breaks because it is actually quite hard to do. Yeah. Um, and actually I'm going to be start starting to do that again. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, and it's a big challenge. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can do that to help with your cadence as well. Uh, there's a lot of drills out there. So run cadence is really important. It's the Mm -hmm. same thing as like bike, I mean, bike cadence and swim cadence it, but you want to make sure that you have the right form so you're not it doesn't feel like you're just spinning mm-hmm. your wheels and you don't want to overstride with a fast cadence which would actually be nearly it, not I want to say impossible because you could do it mm-hmm. um, but I also like like we talked about before when you throw in some strides like some 20 second accelerations you're going to instinctually feel that cadence pick up mm-hmm. and that's what it feels like um, mm-hmm. and then I also think one thing we haven't touched on is strength Mm-hmm. Like your whole hip component core unit has to be strong because mm-hmm. that's really where if you land your foot, that's where all the like, you're just going to fall apart if you don't have that nice strong core to keep your body upright. So I would I would encourage everyone to get into the gym, make sure you're doing some standard lower leg stuff, some core work, um, and even some balance stuff. If mm-hmm. I, I really like the simple thing of just standing on one leg, eyes closed, trying to slightly bend your leg and hold it for 30 seconds. A lot of people can't do that. And I mean, if you think about running, it's one foot on the ground and not both. And then you're slightly in the air at times. So you need to have that balance and, and -hmm. stability and it won't come um, if you don't already have it. So it's really good to have some practice. Yeah. We do a lot of one legged stuff in my strength Mm -hmm. classes that I teach. We, we even throw it in, we'll do lock, walking lunges with like a knee up in between, anything to uh, with pauses. Um, I love that. And then also with the strength component, the feet, um, I've been doing a lot of toe yoga <laughs> and foot strengthening <laughs> and uh, calf strengthening and all sorts of things to protect the feet because that's a lot of, it's just a lot of force going through the feet. So all of that you need to think of. And I think, I can't remember if I mentioned it. Sometimes it gets a little overwhelming to think about how do I fit all of this strength component and prehab and rehab and band work? And how do I get that all in? And I've been going foot up. So if when I'm doing a program, maybe not in the gym, maybe 15 minutes before I run, I will start with my feet and work all the way up to my glute and core and then That's I will go way to around. Remember it. Yeah, yeah, because other, I, it was kind of like I was like skipping around. I was like, all right, I'm gonna do my band walks. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm gonna go on the floor and do my glute bridges. Oh, wait, I've got to do my bird dogs <laughs> and like all of this stuff. And uh, and then I was like, all right, let's just start at the bottom with the toes and work my way up. And I try to do I try to do a warm up, a activation set. I take 10 to 15 minutes before my run, unless I'm running off the bike, and I take the time to do that. So when I get out on the run, everything is ready to go and Mm -hmm. firing. And I mean, the older you get, the more you really have to think about that. Uh, Because, Or the other thing I want to say is make sure that first mile is easy (laughs) Mm -hmm. and you're not coming out too hot unless you're coming off the bike and you have to do some special tempo run or something. But, uh, 
Another easy way is just walk for five minutes. And, you know, if you read anything about the Kenyan runners, they're going literally like 15 minutes per mile and Mm -hmm. progressing it all the way to freaking, sorry, (laughs) like four minute miles, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just a slow, slow progression. And so when I train athletes, I I do a lot of progressive runs Mm -hmm. where you're starting pretty I mean, from a walk, basically walk, jog all the way and progress the run as it goes Mm -hmm. um, to your pace and your heart rate. If you see it on a graph should slowly increase. It shouldn't just come a bat out of hell and then just be really sporadic. You want a really nice, solid progression. Yeah. But you know, if your first mile or two is so slow, what's your Strava pace going to say? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Gosh, you're going to look. That is the issue. I know you're going to look so slow on Strava if your first two miles are at your recovery pace. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, that, if that bothers you, I, we we should talk. That, that does not bother me. <laughs> oh, well, I'm bother. I'm talking about the audience. Oh, yeah, <laughs> if that bothers you. Yeah, actually, I've come to love posting, like really, like actually, some of my, a lot of my Strava stuff is hidden just because I do like little workouts. Nobody needs to see it, but um it's kind of fun to like post all these like super slow runs. And then like you share your, a race. Cause I love looking at people's races mm-hmm. on Strava and giving them kudos. It's fun. Uh, and then you like, you're like, Oh, Whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, make sure you're progressing those runs. That's a really, really good point. The other thing speaking before we put the cadence thing to bed, because we kind of got off track is when you're doing your easy runs is an awesome time to work on cadence because Mm. if you really do it right, you can still hit a pretty solid like run cadence in your recovery runs and Mm -hmm. just work on just easy force off the ground and um, a nice, nice form forward lean. And I, I really come to enjoy that. And then I like checking my cadence Mm -hmm. uh, after just to see how I did. And, and when, when you do that, Mm -hmm. because I've, I've done that with, with some, with some athletes and you feel like you're taking these baby steps and you probably are comparatively to what you're used to feeling like that overstride, which is completely Mm -hmm. overstriding. So think when you're doing this baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, and, yeah. and be okay with that because it'll slowly get better and better and you'll see the improvement come, come fast. Remember when we were at, um, camp in Florida and we went to the track with everybody mm-hmm. and we did that really fun thing, um, where you had everybody stand and then, and lean forward yep. and then you start to run and that mm-hmm. gets your forward lean. And then you had everybody follow me yeah. and try to find my run, <laughs> try to find. So I was running and everybody was behind me, which was very weird. I felt like some weird Pied Piper, but like, <laughs> and everybody was trying to match my cadence and that was kind of fun, but I think it helps. It helps mm-hmm. to have somebody near you or your garment. Oh yeah. Or something. Like even when we first ran together, I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to try to match your cadence. And it was so difficult at first. Yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't run for a while no. together, but I would still probably find it difficult. <laughs> yeah. So that's fun too. And I forgot the last thing I keep saying the last thing, but there's so much to talk about with cadence is I like to find music. Mm. that has a cadence beat and and I do the backbeat usually the one two one two one two Mm -hmm. one two and there's certain songs for my stride length and you know whatever it is where I actually know sometimes what pace I can Mm. be at that cadence and um, I think that comes from spin too Mm because we spin to the beat but it is fun to put on a playlist and find the cadence and that can motivate you too. It's just like your metronome, but mm-hmm. it's just. Um, and then, mm-hmm. and then, lastly, sorry, I just remembered is if you're having some is- some issues trying to to pick that up, mm-hmm. is get on a treadmill even for five oh. for five minutes, and and because the treadmill automatically makes you have a faster cadence yeah. in general, so it's a really good focused way where you can just say, okay, I'm going to spend the next five minutes and just really try to do, you know, 180 or or what have you. Um, but yeah. I find it, it helps a ton. I, I, I find it hard running on the treadmill. I don't know. Like I just can't hit the speeds that I want to. Yeah, no, or like in the, general. I, when I run on the treadmill, only if I have to, I tend to just keep it really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I know some people do not, like they can haul on a treadmill. I just find I can't, it's hard for me to do speed work on a treadmill. And I don't know why, maybe because I don't do it a lot, but that's neither here nor there. All right, let's move on. 
and let's talk about, you know what, let's move into that question about power because we did Mm. touch on the stride pod and a long time ago, if you've been listening to these episodes, we did a big piece on running with power. But this question from one of our, uh, actually it's one of your athletes asks, how can you use power as a tool to improve your running? We both now have stride pods. um, So why don't you talk about uh, how you can use, uh, I mean, is there another, actually I have a question that I'm not sure of. Is there another company that makes like a- Um, a Not that I know of that's pretty accurate in sense. I mean- Garmin does have a um, power unit, but it goes in the back of your your waist and it shows a little bit different things. Okay. Um, I, I didn't sometimes know, yeah. watches can kind of estimate your power, um, but really I find that the stride is, is quite quite helpful. Yeah. Um, so the stride basically uh, shows power output. So what you want, so this power output for however you however you look at it, it's kind of like heart rate zones. They don't change. Mm-hmm. So you really want to look at your critical power and then base that, which is kind of like your functional threshold and base your zones in that sense. Um, And there's a lot of calculators online. If you go to the Paladino project, if you really want to dive into it, he's done a lot of research and you can look at um, exactly how to test yourself when you have a stride and then you can put your zones in again, plug. If you need help with that, we can help you that. That is true. Um, so once you have those zones, it's really cool because sometimes heart rate uh, can be finicky because due to due to heat, dehydration, um, general fatigue. If you've done a really high load of training, it's really hard to get your heart rate up at the end of a week if you're if, if you've done that, and it's just because everything's opened up um, in terms of your system, and so hitting those zone one paces or zone two become more difficult as the week progresses and you increase your load of fatigue. Um, so I really like to have some athletes use power because those power numbers don't change. So a zone one power will stay zone one power and, Mm -hmm. uh, training by power is just such a consistent way to look at running paces as well. Um, when you're out in a race and it's hilly, if you can maintain a specific power average, that's going to be way more beneficial than like running as hard as you can up a hill and, you know, um, having a consistent type of power output allows you to just be more efficient. You know, um, you, you're not tapping into a lot of your high sugar stores and, and, um, your body's not going in so much stress going up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I talked about it on the last podcast that I looked, the only metrics I looked at for Boston were heart rate and power. Mm -hmm. And I had figured out where my aerobic power was. I knew where my aerobic heart rate was and they were pretty matched. Uh, and I watched it and, uh, and it was very, very even. And what's really interesting, you were just talking about how heart rate, although heart rate, I use heart rate mostly yesterday, I did an aerobic run but my heart rate was not getting into deep into my aerobic zone, but my power was actually showing tempo. And I was like, okay, do I just go with this? Cause my heart rate's higher. And I kind of kept my tempo power. And guess what? By the end of that run, I was a little bit probably more tapped than I should have been, <laughs> but I was like consciously being like, all right, do I back off my power here? Because even though my heart rate's pretty low and I kind of made a choice <laughs> to go with that tempo and probably should have backed off and watched power. Uh, eventually I did, but I was kind of holding on to it. So it was really interesting because that happened. My heart rate was lower than it. My power was showing and I wasn't going, um, uphill or anything. It was pretty flat. So Mm. I did have a disconnect and I should have watched my power. The other thing the stride power meter will tell you is it will tell you your cadence Mm -hmm. and it will tell you how efficient you are Mm -hmm. um, and other things, your vertical oscillation. And so it's just really neat to see mm -hmm. over time, like if you're making changes and Mm -hmm. um, like you can dive into so many different metrics and it's just, it's fun to see the progression. Um, And it's a bit it's very motivating to um, see when your form power is slowly getting better and better and you want to lower form power over time. And then mm-hmm. um, again, the vertical oscillation, if you're bouncing up and down all the time, that's, that's, that's energy that you c- could go forward with. Mm-hmm. So you really want to look at that number as well. And it's, it, 
it's just helpful. Yeah. And you can see sometimes on your recovery runs, if I'm not paying attention, like my foreign power ratio is higher. You want lower, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lower foreign power ratio. And because you're just not as efficient. Mm -hmm. So I like to look at that. The faster I go, actually, the more efficient I get. So uh, that is one. I mean, it, like, and there's, I mean, the caveat here too is if you're just getting into running or you're just a casual runner, you, you don't need to get a stride pod. It's something that once you've really nailed your heart rate zones and you understand heart rate training and you're just looking for something a little different um, or another metric, that's fine. If you don't even like metrics and data, then don't worry about it. But we both use it and some days I don't even look at it and some days I do. Um, all right. So let's move on now to, all right, this is one of your athletes. And as soon as I say it, you will know who it is. She's going to know. All right. Let's talk about time goals. My, my, my energizer bunny athlete. Uh, let's talk about time <laughs> goals for running. And she specifically says just running races. Mm -hmm. um, and how much time is spent running at or faster than that pace? Like, so once again, We'll use, let's use a marathon. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you want to run a marathon in three hours and 30 minutes, which is probably about an eight-ish minute pace per mile, maybe a little more, uh, probably a little more. You know, how much time do you spend training at that pace, over that pace, and under that pace? Uh, so let's talk about time goals for running. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to run a 330 start running eight minute miles. <laughs> I mean, realistically, that's what you need to do. But I guess my first, first and foremost is where are you getting this number from? How are you getting this goal? Have you, have you proven, mm -hmm. have you shown in some type of training aspect that you feel that that's accurate that you can actually do? Right. Um, so you want an accurate goal first. Um, you want something to challenge you, of course, but you want to make sure that it's something you can actually, um, try to achieve. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can always fall short, of course. I mean, um, but in terms of time goals for running, I mean, they are massive. I mean, I, I have a, like, if I were to do a marathon, I would definitely have a time goal. Um, but I would, I would look at where you are in your aerobic work first, because if that is not slightly close to that, that, uh, pace per mile, um, it's going to be pretty difficult to see that over time. So you are going at a higher heart rate in say a marathon mm -hmm. than your like average aerobic pace, but there's lots of cal there's lots of calculators out there that can actually take your zone one or your aerobic pace and uh, multiply that and like just kind of estimate where your marathon pace would be. Yeah, and that's that's a really good indicator if if your goal is achievable where you are right now. Now let's say you, you pop in all these numbers and your goal pace is 330, but then these calculators are saying, you know, 345. Well, how much time do you have until your marathon? Because obviously you're going to make improvements until then. Um, so you want to look at that and, and I say, and then, you know, six to eight weeks, you could probably make some changes. I don't know if it's 15 seconds per mile, but you could definitely improve. Um, Again, all of that comes comes together if you have a massive aerobic base and you slowly build in the strength, the speed, you you taper right, you have you have the chassis, you have the amount of miles under you. I mean, that's a massive thing. So it, it it's really an overall outlook of how you're training toward your race. Um and and making sure that it's realistic. Yeah. And I would say in terms of the miles at marathon pace or above. I mean, like we talked about before, you don't need speed work for like a marathon right away. And then you get into a little bit of tempo running, which is, you know, right around your marathon pace or a little bit above. And then you can do some shorter speed work, but you don't need a lot of those like 400s or anything like that in a marathon build. You can throw a few in to get your your cadence, work your VO2 max. But if you're working VO2 max on the bike or something, you don't necessarily need that as much. Um, I'm a huge fan of tempo running when you're marathon training, which would be a little bit above your aerobic pace. I love using hill repeats, even if you're doing a flat marathon or a flat half marathon. Um, hill repeats are going to make you stronger. They're just going to challenge your glutes and different muscles. So I love doing that. Plus it gets you into 
a higher heart rate if you're mm-hmm. pushing it without like doing that straight speed work that can sometimes get you people injured because you can go out too fast or if something's bothering you a little bit, speed work's going to exacerbate that. And then as you get close to your marathon, I like doing marathon pace miles in there. So you might start with just one mile at that marathon pace or heart rate. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to use both when we're marathon training, looking at pace and heart rate, because pace is going to vary. Like it's really hard unless you're a very experienced runner. Like if your goal is an eight minute mile for a marathon, if you're a very experienced runner, sometimes you know that you're at an eight minute mile or you're at a Mm -hmm. 745. You kind of can lock it in. But especially when you're starting out, you might not know where that eight minute mile pace, what that feels like in your whole body and effort. So you can do like, you know, high tempo, whatever it is. So I'd like starting with that. And then for very experienced marathoners, my favorite, one of the last runs I like to do or give is the 20 miler, which we kind of talked about last week that you don't have to do a 20 miler, but if you are going to do it, you do 10 miles at like just aerobic steady And then you do 10 miles at your marathon effort. And that's your like last hard run. How many weeks do you give that? That's usually two or three. It depends on the runner. Yeah. Three weeks. I would say build. And And that's for experienced runners. A caveat that I do with a lot of my athletes is I don't I don't allow them to run anywhere past like three hours. Yes. I mean, no, three yes, hours is, yes. is actually really high. I, I would max out maybe at 240 for mm-hmm. some people. If they are a walk jogger and they're going to take four or five hours to um, complete the marathon, like past four hours, I still don't go past that. I mean, you can go for some long hikes, but that load on the system is just so hard to recover from week in and week out. Like it, it's just not, it's, it's just not good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, I should have said, I was thinking about our 3.30 marathoner yeah. because Patty, who was on our podcast, she ran Boston. And when she wanted to do the 20 miler, which as you heard, it kind of went disastrously because it was like so hot and humid in Florida. Um, I did make a note and I didn't have her do the 10 and 10, that 10 mile and 10 mile. We did a different run mm-hmm. for Patty. Mm-hmm. So this is like, like totally different. We did a little bit, we did about uh six to eight miles at her marathon pace. Nice. But I said, cap it at three hours. I said, mm-hmm. so if you're at 17 miles and it's three hours, you're done. Exactly, um, yeah. So that is the caveat. I was thinking about a 3.30 marathon, but some and the, tempo and the, miles are yeah. good. And the, well, one thing I like about that is you're doing a progressive run again. I think yeah. all runs really mm-hmm. should be progressive. Yeah. Um, they're just so much better on the system. And The one thing I also like to, if you are cross training or you're a triathlete and you're still doing marathon, I mean, the miles that you do on the bike, the, the, the hours that you cross train that transfers over. So in your overall Mm -hmm. general buildup for your race, you want to look at that. And you also want to look at, um, ways to recover and and the best ways to recover are just go, go spin on a bike or go for an easy swim. Mm -hmm. I mean, getting that blood flow is super helpful, especially if you're just a runner, like, or trying to just do a marathon. I shouldn't say just because <laughs> just like only a marathon or even just a 10k. A I mean, like I think 10k's are extremely hard. Oh my gosh, 10k's um. <laughs> are so hard. Yeah, and honestly, I don't even know. Next time I train for a marathon, I don't even know if I will do a 20 miler. And if I do a 20 miler, I will have walk breaks in there. I mean, I think what you did mm-hmm. in Boston mm-hmm. on what you did should prove that you do not need to do a 20 right. miler. But I could have done it way faster. <laughs> You think maybe, 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 no, I knew I could, but that, but like, that's a prime example of how cross training is Mm -hmm. so beneficial. Like you Mm -hmm. just had, you had Mm -hmm. all this aerobic ability and you didn't have to do it all in a run. Like, I mean, you, you did not like, yeah. And that's, that's the great thing about Mm -hmm. triathlon. It's, it allows you to be like, be, uh, allow you to, uh, do workouts that are a lot, a lot easier on the body and you can recover from. Yeah. I mean, so I don't think if to answer the question in terms of goal pace, you don't need to do a ton of speed work. You can do, I love the tempo efforts, but I like breaking up the tempo efforts, you know, into either three by six minutes and then you can go, you know, one mile and you can do two mile tempo and you don't have to you just don't go all out because you're Mm going to trash yourself in your training. And that's Mm -hmm. not the point. Save it for the race. Now, if you want to flip it and you want to do a really fast 5k, 
you're still going to do a lot of aerobic work, but you are going to have some more upper end speed work as well. And it's going to be shorter. Um, I don't have a goal of doing a fast 5k because I think the hardest race out there on the planet is a 5k. (laughs) If you are actually racing it, oh my gosh, you are redlining it. And I don't have that top end speed anymore because I don't train a lot of it. Um, so I don't know. When was the last time you did a 5k? (laughs) Well, actually I did. I did a test about four weeks ago on my own. Um, and it was roughly 5k. I would say roughly, but yeah, like a full on 5k. Haven't done that for a while, but I, I think they're great. I think they're great testing things. They're, they're quick and short and hard as hell. And, um, maybe we should do one. We do a 5K? Yeah. Oh my gosh. My 5K <laughs> time is very, I told you, I'm built for the com- Brewster 5K. There, you know <laughs> what? There is one this weekend, but we're not going to uh-huh. be away. But um, I'm built for comfort, not speed. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really good motto we should get on. Yeah, I'm built for comfort, not speed. <laughs> I'm built for that long distance. Uh-huh. No, maybe, you know what? Maybe one, maybe for, maybe a goal one day should be doing a fast 5K because I've never yeah, had a super kind of fast fun. 5K because I've never made it a goal. That is also really fun. All right, let's keep going now. And let's talk about one of our favorite things to talk about, which is nutrition tips for the run. Mm -hmm. All right. So what is your go-to when you're doing a run? What are your like tenants? Like this is what I always do. And then it kind of wiggle room depending on what you're doing. So yeah, what are your I things? usually go out with a gel. Um, mm-hmm. If it's a recovery jog, I carry a gel just in case. My, my recovery jogs are only up to 35 minutes max. Mm-hmm. So I always have that. If I'm doing anything aerobic, I usually head out with a gel uh, in me mm-hmm. in the first five to 10 minutes. And then I basically have a gel every 20, 25 minutes. Um, that's kind of the gold standard mm-hmm. for myself. Um, I use, I use other products as well. If, if it's anything over I, an hour, I like to carry f- hydration. Oh yeah. Um, if you're in like the heat of Florida, I mean, you're going to need it right away. Yeah. So if that's the case, I always have athletes carry like a hydration belt or some type of hydration in their hand. Um, and I just kind of keep it that simple for mm-hmm. the running. Yeah. Um, I like to make sure I don't do any runs. I really don't do any runs fasted, even recovery runs. I like to eat something like an hour before if I can do it. If it's an easy run, I can eat something closer. Usually it's like simple gluten-free toast and peanut butter, or even sometimes just a half a banana. And if it's been a while, I will take a gel, but I, I do the same thing. I'm pretty simple. It's just gel every like 20. 25 minutes. And I usually run with water because Mm -hmm. the gels have sodium. And Mm -hmm. most of the time what's on course, you have Gatorade and water because I don't, I don't run with hydration in my Mm -hmm. races. So I usually take water from the course. I know you do Gatorade and it's kind of whatever Um, works for you. I do a little bit of both, especially now that I'm, I'm with, uh, I use power bar consistently because there's quite a bit of sodium in power bar. So that's, that was always my concern of just, you know, I mean, just, just as a caveat, make sure you look at what you're taking in because yeah. not all gels are created equal. Like some gels have no salt in them whatsoever. So you have to really take a look at what you're ingesting and you want to have a good ratio of sodium and, and carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's, I just keep it really simple. Um, I don't like to take blocks on, I don't like to chew and run. So I will only take in gels. And I, like I said last week, I took eight gels at Boston. And like, yeah, it gets a little gross. I did, I did alternate Martin, even though it had lower sodium content, but like, that's what racing is. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, I, sometimes are like, Oh, that's a lot of gels. It's like, well, that's what it is. If you're burning through that, suck it up. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Literally and figuratively (laughs) suck it down. And I I mean, I mean, I don't think gels are that bad. They're no, I don't either. Sugar. Like how, how do people not like sugar? (laughs) I don't know. And it worked. I said, like, I mean, you can stay really, really strong if, um, if you're having gut issues with running, I would think about what you've been eating the night before, what you ate before you ran, what kind of gels you're using, how much fluid you're taking with mm-hmm. those gels. Um, you know, go back and listen to the podcast we did with Patty with the Boston Marathon. She has IBS, and we worked for five months 
on training her gut and she had not one issue in Boston, which is pretty, which is amazing. I mean, this was a person who couldn't even run like two or three miles without hitting a bathroom when we first started. And she found what worked and it was, it was awesome. So Mm -hmm. keep it really simple. You don't, you know, you don't need much, but I will say that run I did yesterday, it was an hour aerobic and I forgot nutrition. Mm. I only had my water belt on me because I left it on the counter Mm -hmm. and I spaced out. And the whole time I was just praying, don't bonk, don't bonk. Because we had had done a swim before Mm -hmm. and I did eat in between, but I was like, oh God, oh God. (laughs) So I was like praying. So it was, that was a bad, bad move. And and just talking about, about the bonk, like when you're really low in, in, sugar and you can feel it i honestly the best best remedy is stop Mm -hmm. and take in as many calories as you can if you have three gels on you take those three gels because Mm -hmm. you're already so depleted and behind you need to get that and i swear you can you can recover if you take in the sugar right away Mm -hmm. um and you just have to give yourself five to ten minutes so if you feel like you're bonking or you are bonking take in your stuff if you don't have have stuff on you well yeah. You didn't learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I, I'm not I'm not this this rough, but but, no, but, but it, technically you haven't. Like you should always always go out the door with some type of nutrition, even if it's a recovery run. I, I've had runs where I'm like, "Ah, I'll be fine." And I literally like was praying like you for the yeah. like it was a recovery run and I had 10 minutes left and I just was like delirious. And yeah. I was so upset with myself because it's so easy to fix. Just take the gel, you know? Yeah. And I will say too, let's say you're on an hour run or even an hour 10 or something. And so I took a gel at like 25 and then, you know, you're supposed to take a gel at 50, but you're 10 minutes from home. Take the gel yeah. at 50 minutes. Um, same thing in a race. I was due for a gel at 24 miles at Boston. It was only two miles to the finish. I took the gel because it you can really go from like you can go from like feeling good to depleted and like zero to zero. Oh my god! In like ten <laughs> seconds. Um, yeah. And the same thing too. I mean, this usually happens to me on the bike. If you're getting grumpy, or all of a sudden your mood changes on your run mm-hmm. or on the bike, and all of a sudden you're like, ah, f this. <laughs> it's probably because your sugar you're getting low. So eat something fast. And I never eat solids on the on the run. All right. So we did have some more questions. We're going to have to somehow do a part two um, later. But if you have, if you need any help on your power, if you're interested in power, if you're interested in a run video, email iracelikeagirl at gmail.com. Send us more questions. And uh, don't forget to support our podcast with the 250 Miles in May Challenge. The link is in the show notes in the little description. And you can also find it at our Instagram at Amy Woods Fitness and at Angela Nathan, our bios. We would love to see you riding this month. So thanks so much for listening and have a good day. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. And we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.